Success. Okay, great. Oh, look at you. Okay, uh, sorry for the delay. We're going to get right into it. So today we're talking about uh, TCP, right? So up until this point, we've talked about how to do port scanning with TCP, right? And we saw that there's all these different ways we can try to extract some useful information uh, about another machine's TCP port, right? We try to determine is there a service running and listening on that port. Um, so we saw um, connect scanning, SIN scanning, fin scanning, Christmas tree scanning, all kinds of crazy scanning. We saw idle scanning where we could see that we could actually use a third, another machine to actually try to scan our victim, right? Which is a very cool security technique. Uh, so some of the other things we can learn. So from that, right? So um, Christmas tree scans, fin scans, right? They all depend on the behavior of the specific. Did I shut it off? I spent so long trying to turn it on. I, I found the button. It's here, which is impossible to see when it's off, which seems like a terrible design. Okay, so we saw that with all these kinds of scanning, right, they take advantage of certain peculiar, peculiarities of certain uh, types of TCP IP implementation, right? Specifically, what happens if I send a TCP IP packet with all ones as the flags or all zeros as the flags, right? And so what we can actually use and some techniques that have been used, um, one of the things we want to discover, right, when we're trying to, or a hacker would like to discover, is what operating system is that machine running, right? Oftentimes, you just have an IP address, so you don't know if it's Windows or if it's Linux or BSD or an iPhone or any of these other things. Um, so what people have found is you can actually use these weird bits of uh, the difference between the different TCP IP implementations, and you can try to fingerprint the operating system to try to say, is it a Windows machine? Is it a Linux machine? What kind of machine is it? So the idea is you can craft packets to the host to try to determine what kind of operating system it's actually running. Uh, this is actually a very, very cool technique. So you could say, what happens if I send a fin packet? What happens? What does it do? Or how, what if I respond to a fin packet by sending more data? Right? Does it send a request packet? Uh, what if I acknowledge the wrong thing? Uh, all these kinds of things. So um, if I... Yeah, so some like weird combinations of flags in certain operating systems will uh, drop the packet in certain operating systems. It'll send a reset packet, so you can use that determination to try to fingerprint the version number. Uh, you can use the, sometimes the initial sequence numbers will be different. The window size will be different on different devices, different operating systems, different, um, uh, yeah, devices, operating systems. What happens when I send ICMP messages, right? Does it block the ICMP messages? Does it have some kind of an error rate? Uh, how much of the attending datagram, so if there's a bad packet, how much of that packet does it include in the reply to help you debug? Certain implementations do it differently. What happens with TCP options? Does it respect certain TCP options or not? Um, so it's actually very cool. So you can do this in a, um, in a passive manner with a program like POF, which will actually just look at all the network traffic and be able to determine or try to determine, hey, this looks like a Windows 7 machine, or this looks like a Linux machine. Um, other things, Nmap has a configuration for this where you can say, hey, try to determine what operating system it is. I think it's the dash big O sign. And so it has essentially, if you think about it, a tree, right, of all these different, if I send this packet, if I get this response, it means it's in this half. And if I get this other response, it means it's other half, and it can refine all the way down to try to determine exactly what operating system it's running. What are some things you have to be careful of here? So what does it tell us when it says, I think this IP address is this operating system? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. So 
yeah, maybe before you, in the time between you made the scan versus the time you actually launched an attack, maybe the OS got upgraded. based on the packets that I sent to it and its responses, right? So if that IP is actually a load balancer for two different machines, who knows where those packets actually went? If they went to the behind the load balancer machine, if it went to one of those two machines, or if it went to the load balancer itself, right? Or what about, think about ASU, right? Or your home, right? You're probably not connected directly to the internet, right? You have a router in between you and the internet that's doing natting so that it appears that all of your traffic is coming from one IP address, right? So then, who's it scanning, really? Right? All your packets are going to be dropped from the router, and so it's just going to say, I couldn't really determine the operating system. And even if it could, it's probably wrong, right? Because it's not actually getting through. So these are just some things to keep in mind, right? So this is more about, okay, I can use this tool, right, to run, and it'll give me some output. But really, to trust that, I need to know how it's working. Right, so I need, to, I need to understand more about the operating system. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to our old friend spoofing. So what is spoofing again? What is it? Yeah, we wanna impersonate, we wanna pretend to be some other IP address, right, that we're not, or some other host, right? So the idea is we wanna to try to, yeah, impersonate a host, uh, impersonate another machine when establishing a TCP connection, it was discussed in this paper, which is a really interesting read if you want to do it. Anybody recognize the name there? The RTM, the Morse worm guy. This is like two years before, or a year, I think two years, three years before the worm. Uh, so it's just showing that like, yeah, he was very interested in security and knew what he was talking about and probably had the knowledge to build the worm. Uh, it was also used by Kevin Mitnick in, in his attack against the San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, but now we actually have enough background knowledge where we can understand this attack So why do we want to do this? Why do we want to spoof another host? Get some confidential data. How? Why? Like snooping all the TCP packets and if it's unencrypted then you can get the data from it or... This isn't snooping, right? We're not trying to listen to the packets, we want to spoof. So what, what is that, what are we trying to do? Preventing wrong information. So you'd send wrong information? Yeah, what was that? Right, so yeah, we're, we're taking advantage of the fact that this machine trusts some other machine and trusts it only based on the IP address. Right, so if we can pretend to be that IP address, now we can take advantage of this trust relationship, right? Which is how the Morris worm propagated. And it's how, uh, we'll see how Mitnick got into the San Diego <laughs> Supercomputing Center. So for instance, if host A trusts host B, right, to log in with no password, basically so it's, it's a configuration that says, hey, if you're coming from host B, then you don't have to type in your password because I trust you, right? I trust this IP address. So we want to impersonate node B to get this trusted relationship, right? Because host A does not trust us, right? Host A only trusts host B. We're some third thing. So what do we want to do at a high level? What do we have to do to be able to think about, like, to be successful, how are we going to spoof this connection? TCP. What do we know we have to do? What's it? Handshake. Handshake. Yeah, we have to do a three-way handshake with C as if it's coming from B. Right, so let's walk through that process, right? So what's the first thing we're going to want to send? A send to B from who? From C, right, exactly. From, sorry, from B, we're gonna send it yeah, to A from B, but actually from us, right? So then host node A, then what are they gonna send? A SYNAC back to host B from host A, and then we have to reply with what? An ACK from host B to host A that has the correct sequence and acknowledgement numbers from that other host, right? But what's, what's one problem? So let's say 
say we try to do this, right? We send a packet to host A, a send packet to host A from host B. What are they going to do? A send act to B, and then what's B going to do? Reset. Yeah, reset and be like, what are you talking about? We haven't made this connection, right? Reset. So we first, our very first step is we need to somehow kill A or, or kill B or have it not respond, right, to these uh, the sin requests. Because if it responds and resets our connection, then the whole game is up. Uh, it's not that difficult. We could probably take off, out B pretty, pretty easily. And we only need to really be successful once, right? So we could just make a lot of traffic and keep trying this over and over, and maybe one time that packet, that reset packet gets dropped, and then our attack was successful, right? So as an attacker, we have time on our side because we only need it to work once, right? We first have to kill B, then, just like we said, right? Then it's trivial, quote, quote, from a high level, right? Because all we have to do, all we have to do, well, so is this part difficult? Is sending a TCP SYN packet with a spoofed IP, a spoofed source IP difficult? No. No, trivial, right? We saw that in, in the IP layer, right? We can just spoof ICMP messages, we can spoof UDP packets, all that. So when A replies back with its SYNAC, right? So B, we're counting on B ignoring this packet, right? Because we've denial of served it, denial of service that we've taken it off the network, it's not gonna respond. So do we get that packet, that SYNAC packet? No. no. Does, so is this a bad thing? Yes. Yeah, it makes things a lot harder, right? Why does it make things harder? We don't know the sequence number. Yes, the sequence. We have to reply back with a valid sequence number, right? A A is going to generate this server side sequence number, right? And we have to acknowledge that with, in this case, S S plus one, right? To to establish the connection. So we don't get that, but we have to reply with that plus one. <laughs> so how can we do this? So let's think attack mode. Is all hope lost? Can we never do this? Yeah? What happens when B receives a bad act back from the sin? So it sends the sin act. Mm -hmm. What does B do? Can I send multiple acts with different? I actually don't know off the top of my head. You I would just blast it. Yeah, so you could guess. I mean, that'd be a brute force. <laughs> I think. I, I think that it would drop the connection or it would send a reset or something and said, like, hey, something messed up is off the top of my head. But either way, you could just brute force in the sense that you just keep doing it two to 32 times, right? Uh, you don't have to send two to 32 packets, act packets, right? You can do a sin, they send a sin act, and then you send an act with one thing, then you send a reset, and then just keep doing that again. sequence number is, right? And we can be reasonably certain we actually know what that is. What's another way, though? Maybe I accidentally put it out of scope. Yeah. Yeah, right? If we eavesdrop that packet, if we see that packet somehow, then it's great. Then we're good. Right? If that node is on our Wi-Fi network and we're sniffing packets because it's an unencrypted Wi-Fi, then we see that packet and we can use that sequence number. We can just use it, right? Or we have to somehow guess it, right? And somehow guess correctly the sequence number, right? Then we can do sin plus one and everything's good. So let's see how this looks like. So uh, we first, what's the very first thing we want to do? Kill B. Kill B. We first need to kill B, right? Make sure it does not send any packets. Then we're going to send a packet to A as if it was from B, right? And um, so we send the sin, and then they're going to send the sin act to host B, which we don't see. And then we have to somehow try to reply with, right? So we need to make sure that this act here is this sequence number plus one. And then we can send data, and everything's going to go properly. 
so this is tricky. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, the spec said that the sequence number should be random, right? Didn't really specify how to actually do this. So there's been tried to updates of how to improve that. Uh, but oftentimes implementations don't actually generate random numbers in a real random sense. Um, so there's a great paper uh, called Strange Attractors and TCP IP Sequence Number Analysis, uh, where basically they look at the distribution of sequence numbers in, um, in like a graph space. And so you can see how it looks like. So you can see based on, I believe it's calculating the X value of the difference between sequence, like the past two sequence, uh, you take n minus one, n minus two, and n minus three, so the last three sequence numbers. And you can take basically the delta between two and three and the delta between one and two and graph that delta. So what is this kind of going to show you? Oh, I guess this does actually in three dimensions. Yes. Right. What's this going to show you then? So there are some things pattern generated in three dimension which says it's not exactly random. And exact random one then it's very specific. Right, so if it's random, how should it look in this 3D space? Uh, a complete sphere uh, with equally uniform distributed points. Yeah, right, so it should be dis dispersed or some kind of, look, kind of look like a cloud in some sense, right? Very uh, dispersed is how we want it to look, right? Because if it's not, then that means we can predict what the sequence numbers are going to be here. And if we can predict the sequence numbers, then this three-way handshake thing we can completely spoof trivially even if we're not able to eavesdrop on that Synac packet. So it turns out by doing this to a bunch of operating systems, you get some super secure looking clouds like this. So this is for Windows 2000 XP, which is pretty good, right? I mean, it's fairly distributed. There is like a concentration here, right? So this is Windows 95 and 98. <laughs> Probably not where you want to be, right? Pretty insecure. Uh, so this is Linux, the Linux distribution, right? So this is kind of what you'd want it to be, kind of this distributed cloud. Uh, here's like the FreeBSD one, which is actually even more dispersed. And, um, so we talked about, I believe, the Cisco operating system on the routers, right? It's called iOS, heavily confusing. So they had a problem, what they called before the cure, so after they did this fix, they, you could see that it was followed this very even distribution pattern that was very easy to predict. And then after they fixed it, it disperses. Like this is actually very well dispersed. I, I don't know if it's coming through on all the, okay. Uh, kind of shows up there a little bit, but it's very dispersed. Uh, on the Mac, the Mac was also fairly dispersed. Uh, HP, I actually don't know what's it. Is it HP Unix? Is that what the UX yeah. stands for? Okay, you can see that it's definitely not not really distributed how you want it, right? And you can see that after the cure, it actually, when it did get fixed, it has like less of this core. Um, this one, I don't know if you can tell, but there's just like a few dots right here. <laughs> like this is before, yeah. So you can see that it's really hard to get this right. And so TCP, right? And it's interesting to think about, like this is just some, Think about it, I don't know, this is some networking detail, right? Like how do you generate these sequence numbers? So the fact that, you know, when they were writing this TCP specification, doesn't, they didn't specify, you know, how to create random numbers or, or what it would mean to be a random number. Uh, and possibly, I don't know, why didn't they think about that? Are they horrible people? What do you think? <coughs> Should we shame the spec writers? Shame on you. It was nice. Not meant for security purpose when it was designed. Yeah, right. So they probably weren't thinking about, you know, is this is this really a problem? Because it's kind of the administrator who has established this trust relationship between these two hosts, right? And so the fact that this security in essence relies on correctly choosing this one random number that nobody has ever said up to this point that, hey, maybe it's a security problem if this number is not absolutely crazy random, right? Um, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of, uh, in one sense, you know, you can defend them by saying like, well, a spec, they didn't say that it's secure or anything, they're just designing a network protocol. Uh, on the other hand, you can be like, yeah, but you're designing the network protocol that the internet uses, so maybe you should think of security. Uh, the flip side of that, right? They weren't really thinking, nobody, nobody was thinking about security back then. And it wasn't until after
application built on top of that, right, that it actually became a problem. Right? If nobody trusted IP addresses, then this wouldn't be really as near a problem. <coughs> but the fact that this trust relationship exists really does cause a problem. Okay, so we talked about spoofing. So what's the difference between spoofing and hijacking? So the idea, so what are we gonna do? So we wanna do this, what do we have to do? So do we need to do like a sin, sin, act, and an act? No, what do we have to do? Route the packets towards us. Route the packets towards us, what do we can? I mean, at a high level, what do we have to do? Maybe mirror all the traffic. Mirror all the traffic. Maybe that could be a technique. These are all techniques we can use to do this. Kill, kill the B and take the session. Could kill B. Yeah, we'll see that uh, we may need to do that or it may happen automatically. Man in the middle. Man in the middle. Essentially, that's what we're doing, right? We want to try to inject some traffic into the middle there. What do we do? Like, so. Switching or become a switch or become a router. So, router like a router. Uh, Not quite. Hubs. These are all uh, techniques, right? At a high level, what are we doing? Change entering the ARP table. Change entering the ARP table, that's going to be how we want to actually do it. Or kill a session at B side, but just and connect that session to us. Um, almost. Close. How many packets do we, let's say we just want to inject some data into the conversation. How many packets do we have to send? So before we need to send two of the three way handshake, how many packets do we need to send? Just one if you have to send. Just one, right? If our data can fit into that one. Make the system accept that it is a valid data. <coughs> so how do we make the system accept that it's a valid data from this Some communication? communication? How does it know? How does the, the, the host know that it's a valid data? <coughs> yes, the sequence number is what it's expecting, right? Is inside the window. What else? Source ID. Source ID, what else? Source port, and what else? Destination IP, destination port. Yeah, exactly, right? So this is where all that studying, all those crazy details of this, these protocols, right? So it knows it's the connection because source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, right? And it knows where that data goes because it's inside the TCP window, right? That, that sequence number is inside there. So that's essentially all we have to do is throw a packet out and make sure that it's in that window, right? How we actually do that we can use all of these techniques that everyone's saying about how to actually eavesdrop on this communication channel or how to, uh, how to maybe take control and do kind of a man in the middle thing. So the idea is, yeah, we're gonna try to you know, insert, most often, and the most interesting case is when we wanna insert some data in there, right? But we could also, if we wanna do like a denial of service, we could just send a reset packet, right? To make it close the string, which could be, could have important security ramifications, right? Uh, if you can stop the backup process after you've broken into a server, now maybe your actions aren't backed up anywhere, and so you're less likely to get caught. So, but we have to do the, we have to have the correct sequence and acknowledgement numbers, right? So that way, every, we know that everything's in, in order. Um, so we talked about that, right? You all actually had incredibly good suggestions based on what we've learned so far. Right, so we can eavesdrop the traffic, right? And we can see we could eavesdrop the traffic by doing ARP poisoning, right, and getting everyone to send their packets to us, right, if we're on the local network. We can also eavesdrop if we were to uh, turn the switch into a hub or if we were on a hub and could see all the traffic on there. Uh, we can also guess the correct sequence and act numbers. Uh, and so there's a good paper to read if you want to learn more about that, about how to do this. 
So, one problem is, right, if we want to inject data, so the two sides are continually exchanging information, what's going to happen to that, the TCP window that we want to inject into? Yeah, it's going to be slight. It's going to be constantly changing, right? As they continue changing data, so it's like kind of like trying to hit a moving target, right? It's going to be harder to try to land in there if it's constantly moving, right? So the first thing is we kind of want to try to wait until the connection is quiet, right? And nobody's really sending any data. Um, so both endpoints have acknowledged all the traffic. Now we just need to somehow get in there. So then we inject our data in the stream. Right, let's say we're able to do this, we correctly guess or whatever. What's going to happen now to both of our endpoints and their view of this TCP connection? The SP customer would have been changed now. Yeah, on which, on both of them? Uh, on one of them. Yes, yes, on one of them, right? And that's, is that a problem? Yeah. Yeah, right? They're never going to be able to talk to each other because one side's going to say, hey, here's, if I inject, let's say it's sequence number 10, right? And the side that I injected acknowledges that. The next time the other side tries to talk, it's going to send that at sequence 10. It sends, hey, here's sequence 10. And the other side goes, I already got this. I'm expecting 20. What are you doing? And so they can never, so we've essentially, if you think about it, right? If you think about kind of the state of the TCP connection on both sides being the current sequence and acknowledgement numbers, right, that they've seen on both sides. I mean, desynchronize this process. Um, so, what's going to happen after we successfully do this? So, let's think about this. Right? So, we have this connection. Let's go with 10. Right? We're starting at sequence number 10. They're both quiet, not talking. Nobody's terminated the connection. We inject a packet 10. Right? Here's 10 bytes of data starting at sequence number 10 to host A, then what, uh, coming from host B, right? So what's host A gonna do when it receives that packet? Drop the packet, it's because it has already got the packet. No, no, from us, our packet. So we're, we're gonna roll back again and start from the beginning. Right, so they're not talking. A is expecting sequence number 10. Mm -hmm. B hasn't sent it yet. We send 10 byte packet starting at sequence number 10 to host A coming from host B. Yeah. Right, what happens when A gets that packet? He will acknowledge the packet. It'll acknowledge the packet, right? So it's going to send a zero byte packet. It's going to acknowledge. Its acknowledgement number is going to be 20. Let's say, I've read up to sequence byte 19. The next byte I'm expecting is byte 20. Um, it's going to send that back. So what's the other side going to do? Send a reset. Um, yeah, actually, it's one of these things. Well, kind of weird, right? Now we're acknowledging data that we actually never sent. Um, so we're going to inject in there, right? And when the receiver of that data we inject, they're going to acknowledge, just like we said, and say, hey, great, I've seen up to 20. Um, when the person we just moved gets that, they're actually not going to reset. They're going to say, actually, I've only sent you up to 10. Like, here's an acknowledgment. Uh, I'm for sequence number 10, like I've only sent you up to 10. And because the, um, but the receiver gets that and it thinks, well, okay, I'm getting an act for like an earlier packet. So I should send back that, hey, I'm actually at 20. This is what I've received. And then the recipient's gonna get that and this whole cycle is going to keep repeating where they continue to acknowledge each other uh, until what happens? Yeah, one packet gets dropped, <laughs> right? So it's kind of like one side goes, hey, great, I'm expecting 20. And then the guy goes, uh, I'm only expect I only sent 10. And the guy goes, no, 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 I'm expecting 20. No, 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 I'm expecting 10, right? So one packet gets dropped, and then they're like, that's what I thought, good. <laughs> <laughs> Until they try to send more data or try to do anything else, right? Then there'll be a problem. Um, Right, so the problem is we get this, what's called an act storm, where these hosts just continue to act back and forth. Yeah? So could you as the attacker send something to the other box at the same time, you know, that, that would get them back? In. So send the right message to get them back in sync, so it thinks that it... I think you could. some way to do that? Yes, I think it becomes more difficult. Well, it all depends on how you're getting those, those sequence numbers. Um, if you're getting it because you're eavesdropping the conversation, then yeah, you can do that, right? But if it's because you can guess one way to sequence number, you may not be able to guess the other way. So 
you're never going to be able to act like it came from the other direction. But yeah, it's possible. It just makes it more difficult in a sense. Um, but it's kind of funny to think about this axe storm where you cause this like weird confusion. Um, and so yeah, so anytime they try to send data, they're going to have this problem, and it's just going to go until a packet. And so yeah, so yeah, we could we could do this as an attacker by if we're actually man in the middle lane, we can change the sequence numbers as they come across us, right? So that we maintain this fiction that one side thinks it's on ten, the other side thinks it's on twenty, and we just change that as it comes back and forth. Um, or like Eric said, we could uh, fix this by telling one side, no, oh, it's totally fine, like don't worry about it. So we can see this, right? So we have the client and the server here. So we're our attacker. So they've already established a connection, right? But it's a quiet connection, nothing's happening. So we're gonna send a TCP packet with sequence number, whatever the client's current sequence number is, with 30 bytes of data. Um, and so then they're gonna act back with that, uh, the sequence number plus 30. And they're going to act back, hey, I've actually only sent up to sequence number, right? And this keeps happening until packets are dropped. And so we can actually use this, like, kind of like Eric was alluding to, right? We can use this not just on one way of the conversation, we can use it on both ways. So that, that way we can hijack the entire conversation to do what we want. Or, and I think actually somebody mentioned this, right? We could actually try to reset, reset both packets and then make a new connection between them, right, coming through us. Or we could uh, basically impersonate both sides of the connection here, which is very cool. Uh, so we can actually see an act storm in action. Uh, so here we see two uh, hosts that are desynchronized. So we have that 10 and that 20 to port 23. And so we can see that Let's see. Here's okay. Here's 101, 15, 1112, and it's acknowledging that it's received up to that. Uh, so that with 21 bytes. So it's expecting 101, 51, 533. Dot 10 responds back. Uh, actually, I've only sent you up to 112, right? So this first packet is 21 bytes of in injected HTTP. I'm oh, sorry, HTTP. Uh, injected TCP traffic. And so this continues where they go, no, no, I've seen up to 23. It's like, well, I've sent up to 112. And it just keeps going until finally somebody stops and then it doesn't become a problem anymore. OK, questions on this? Yeah. Doesn't the act storm kind of extend the attacker's window to as long as he wants until something breaks? Ooh. He can go on talking to the server. I mean, yes, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, the um, part of this, right? So this all this relies on is being able to get that sequence number, right? If you can guess the client sequence number, you can inject data. And once you've done that, now you own that connection, right? And they can never send any data to each other. So you can keep sending data. Exactly. Um, I don't know if I'd say it elongates the window, but yeah, in a sense, <laughs> basically as soon as you've done this desync, it's fine for the rest of like you can continually inject data into this stream. Yeah. Uh, when and how yeah. does do the client and server decide if they want to drop, drop the packet? <coughs> they don't actually decide. It's just yeah. At some point, the router will get overflowed, over not overrun, but there'll be too much in the router or the link level or something, or there'll be something else going on, and it'll just stop. I mean, otherwise it'll just continue. send any more data because it thinks they're, they're, they're at different acknowledgement and sequence numbers. It'll try to send out new packets, but when it does, it'll be saying like, no, 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 I'm expecting different bytes, and so they'll be desynced like this. Okay, let's look very briefly before we quick today. I want to talk about some uh, denial of service attacks at the TCP level, and then we'll be able to wrap this up. Um, so a sin flooding attack is a very common and, or I think more common, but it's a 
a way to do a denial of service attack against the TCP implementation. Um, so what happens, so you're a server, right? You get a send packet that comes in. So what do you have to do? What do you reply with first? Send act. And then what are you waiting for? Act. An act back. Right? So as the server, what where does that state of this maybe half open socket live? Right? Because that take that takes some memory, right? Because you need to remember, okay, on this IP, this port. Right? I got a connection on this port from like that, the four tuple, right? Source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. Right? I got a SYN and I sent back a SYN back, a SYN act back. And what else do you have to store? What was that? The, you have to store that port, right? You need to know who it is. What was the sequence number, yeah. You have to send that sequence number that you sent so you know when you get it back if it was the right response. Right? But so, if we think about it from the attacker's perspective, so the attacker can send one packet, right? How much, when the attacker sends a send packet, how much memory do they have to create? Nothing. They don't have to store anything, right? They can just send a send. They wait for that response back, right? But in the meantime, the server, give it, I don't know, it doesn't matter, a meg, right? A meg is clearly too much. But we've caused the server to generate some memory when we had to generate none for ourselves. All right, so this is what a SYN flooding attack is. You just flood with SYN packets to the server, and for each of those SYN packets, the server creates, you know, stores some memory in the kernel in the TCP IP stack, right? And then at some point, and so they respond with a SYN act, and we just never say anything, right? We don't close that. Because what in the TCP spec, you know, says how how long they should wait for the act to a sin act. There's nothing, right? It says, all it says is like, I should send a sin, and then you send a sin act, and then I send an act back, right? But the fact of what that timeout is in between, right? How long you stay waiting, because it could be the network is busy, right? Um, so, for this attack, we can overload the memory of the server and cause it to crash just by sending sin packets. Uh, so, can we spoof the IP address here? Yeah, right? We don't care about that, those response packets, so we can make them come from anywhere, right? Which makes this attack even more tricky. Um, and even if we can't cause it to crash, right? What happens if the TCP IP stack can't allocate any more of these connections? These sends and acts. What happens when somebody else tries to connect? Yeah, it'll drop, right? It can't. It, it can't. If it has a limit, then it's going to say, I can't open this. I'm out of memory or whatever. And so in this way, we can cause a denial of service so that nobody else can talk to this machine. Right? So now we've taken this machine off the network. Um, so there's a couple different ways to deal with this. Uh, one way is like filtering, so we can try to somehow filter these either by the source IP, sometimes the source IP will be constant, so it's trivial to, to filter. Um, we can use more memory, right? We can just say increase the length here. Uh, we can reduce the timeout, right? And say that, okay, let's time out our connections. Um, we can cause like a, uh, some sort of queuing system for our half open connections. So when we get new ones and we're at a limit, we can drop old ones out, right? So we have this, uh, so they're not staying open for a long time. We can limit half open connections coming from a certain, you know, we can put per IP, source IP limits. Um, the other one we can do is we can use SYN cookies, which are actually super cool, uh, which we're gonna go over very briefly. So the idea of a SYN cookie is instead of me allocating memory on the server about what connection was, what the, um, sequence number was, I can actually encode that information in the sequence number that I sent <coughs> you. So that way when I get it back, I can verify that this actually came from me at an earlier time and it's a valid sequence <laughs> number. Um, so it's really cool. So the idea is, uh, and we won't go into the details, but the idea is we're gonna have a counter that increases, right, that's gonna change, so we'll get different uh, sequence numbers here. 
and then we're going to encode the, uh, the specifics aren't really important, but the idea is we're going to use a hash of our counter and the source, destination, IP addresses, and ports, right? So this is the four tuple, right? The source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. We're going to use that in the sequence number along with this counter so that that way when we get an ACK back, right, we don't know anything about this connection, right? We have not stored any state about this SYN, SYN ACK. But I can use this sequence number, I can use the source IP, the source port, the destination IP, the destination port, um, plus this counter T, which is random and the, or random in that the attacker can't guess it, right? I can use that, I can hash all these to see if this actually came from me at an earlier time without knowing or storing any state. Um, so if you enable this, you send back a SYNAC as if you made a new connection, Right? You don't actually make any new connection. You don't actually store any new state on your server. Um, so when you receive an ACK, right, that's to start a new connection, uh, you check that function and you see, hey, is this, did this come from me? Is this from one of the T's that I originally used, this counter? Uh, then it rebuilds this, rebuilds the original SYN packet from that. Uh, but uh, well, that's, I don't really think, yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, it's kind of, it can be a pain. I think some websites actually do use this. It's a setting that you can enable in, uh, like, your kernel. Um, but it goes to kind of a general class of, like, state attacks, right? So if, if it can be the case, so if to cause you, your kernel, to store one megabyte of memory, if it costs me a megabyte of memory, it's not really a denial of service attack, right? Because you know you have to have as much memory as me, which maybe in a distributed botnet setting uh, is a problem. But in this case, for like Amazon or a big company, right? They they can buy a lot of memory. But if it takes zero memory for you to cause me to store one meg, now that's where you have that leverage, right? Where you can just force me to create and allocate all this memory, and then I run out of memory. Um, so this is what, there's a bunch of other denial of service types of attacks that take advantage of this. Uh, so they can do, you know, they can do the sin, sin, act, act, and then not say anything, right? And just have these dummy connections that just store state in the kernel. Um, they can try to overload the process, like how the process limit or the thread limit of your operating system or of your web server. Uh, they can send you, yeah, so this is a tricky one. So if you, um, right, so if they are sending you data but you're not acknowledging it, they have to still buffer that data in case they have to retransmit it to you. So I can make your kernel store a lot more data than it's normally used to by never acknowledging all the data that it sends and continually making these connections. So I drop all the data on the floor, but you still have to keep it in your buffer uh, listening. So there's a lot of these kinds of attacks. So uh, to kind of like wrap up networks and uh, network insecurity, because I really want to do this today. Um, so the idea is, right, the network is important because this is how we get into the computers, right? I mean, this is comp uh, the nodes, the systems are talking to each other, right? This is how, as an attacker, we're able to influence and get into the systems on the computer. Um, and I think it's really important, one of the things we've, I've tried to harp on and I really want you to get to think about is to understand what's trusted and what's not trusted, right? So by studying the IP stack, we saw, hey, the source IP isn't validated or trusted, you know, is not validated by anyone, so anyone can send an IP packet with a source of anybody else's IP address, right? So we can't trust that because an attacker can control that. Right? And that's kind of one of the key ideas here. By looking at networking, you can see what an impact that has, this really small thing in this networking protocol, how big of an impact that has for security. Uh, we saw how we can, we're building up building blocks to attacks, right? So we looked at sniffing, like how we can see things on the network, spoofing, how we can pretend to be other people, hijacking, taking advantage of a connection. Uh, we saw some denial of service attacks, right? So we can, which, are attacks in their own right, and also help us do some of these other attacks, 
right? So these denial of service attacks are important because we can leverage them to do other types of attack. Uh, we saw we could probably brute force some of the sequence numbers pretty easily if it's not very randomly generated. Um, and then we looked at some tools and we talked about some countermeasures. So uh, thanks for being patient today. I appreciate that.